Good morning, everyone. It is Katie Crysdale here from Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, really excited that we're going to have a great session today. It is Friday, March 26th. We're going to be starting in about 25 minutes. We'll bring on our presenter, Brent Miller. He's going to be talking about air quality, a session that I know a lot of us are really excited to, to see and discuss and really dive into. So let me go ahead and put in the chat box the show notes for today for those of you who want to go ahead and access Brent's PowerPoint slides. He has kindly provided those to us. They are on the show notes for today. So let me go ahead and pin those in the chat box. So for those of you who don't know, I first connected with Brent Miller of Automated Aquatics, which is a company based in Edmonton, when I first moved out to Alberta about eight years ago now. And essentially, Automated Aquatics is a commercial swimming pool service company. And Brent is one of the team that works there, along with Jeff and Jordan and Mike and John and Jen and everybody there seems to have a J name. And they were really helpful to me when I ran a commercial aquatic facility in northern Alberta. So I was two and a half hours north of Edmonton in Lac La Biche. And essentially, they were one of the suppliers that I used for my pool chemicals, my controllers, my service calls. Um, they were very, very helpful to me. And they have remained a great connection, somebody that I have directed clients to for support or work. They do many different projects in Northern Alberta, Central Alberta. So essentially, uh, Brent did a session for us last year called Reopening After the COVID-19 Pandemic. So planning to reopen after an emergency closure. And essentially, at that point in time, when he did that session for us in early March, I'll post a link to, the, to that session in the chat box shortly, None of us in Canada probably could have anticipated that we would be closing our aquatic facilities, not just for a couple weeks, but for several months. So I'm based in Alberta near Calgary. And the closures here in Calgary pretty much started March 17th was St. Patrick's Day. And by the following Thursday, which I believe would have been March 20th, we had the mandatory closures of all aquatic facilities here in Alberta of all sizes. Those closures continued throughout the month of April, throughout the month of May, and then into June. Initially, we were all anticipating that swimming pools would be part of phase three reopening. Alberta started reopening early in May, and we anticipated that swimming pools would be part of phase three looking at July. Essentially, swimming pools were moved up relatively quickly to June, and a lot of facilities were caught flat-footed, understandably. They were doing uh, commercial projects, uh, capital renovations. Most of us, myself included, thought that pools would not be able to reopen until July. So we had at least three months of closures here in Alberta for our aquatic facilities, our hot tubs, our spas, all of those. Pools were reopened from late June, early July, up until December. And then in December 2020, pools were forced to close again here in Alberta through the remainder of December, January, and into February. Now we are at the end of March of 2021, and swimming pools are allowed to be partially open with major restrictions on activities. And so that webinar that Brent did last year was really, really instrumental. I've spoken to a lot of pool operators who got a lot of value from that session, really thinking about how do you plan an emergency closure? And then when you've done an emergency closure without the planning, how do you come back from that and reopen your facility? So let me go ahead and put that link in the chat box. If you're just joining us this morning, we had a little bit of confusion regarding the start of the webinar. So we've started a bit early and we're still going to hear from our presenter, Brent Miller, after the hour. So in about 15, 20 minutes. In the meantime, let me go ahead and chat about what sessions we've been seeing so far this week and what we can look ahead to in uh, the final week of the 2021 Pool Aid webinars, which are starting next week. So this week, we had three great sessions. Today is Friday. We're going to be hearing from Brent Miller on air quality. 
Other sessions that we have had this week have been focused more in the pool operations sphere as well as the water safety side of things. So on Monday, we had a great session with Dr. Lindsay Blackstock from the uh, Thompson, River, Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, British Columbia. She was here delivering this session called The Novel Application of a Sweet Technique Using the Artificial Sweetener Acesulfame as an Indicator of Urine in Swimming Pools and Hot Tubs. This was a really great session. Uh, not a lot of people were able to join us because we did meet uh, at an irregular time. So you can look for that recording in about three weeks. I have just started posting the recordings from earlier in March. I just posted our first recording last night from the Monday, March 1st webinar on our YouTube channel. So I would anticipate that for us to get into week three and four will take us another couple weeks. But keep an eye out on YouTube for all of the sessions that you missed that you would like to catch up on, either share with staff or go back and review. Let me put some links in the chat box with what I've been talking about. So our YouTube channel, I've just posted in the chat box. Let me go ahead and post the link to the session that we had on Monday. As always, our presenters are kindly providing their PowerPoint slides available as a downloadable PDF. So you can go and grab the sessions from Dr. Blackstock if you weren't able to join us. Dr. Blackstock's research is basically looking at P levels in the pool. And the reason that's important to us as pool operators is understanding really that compliance piece from our customers, from our staff. And that's gonna tie in a lot today into what Brent Miller will be discussing with regards to disinfection byproducts, the creation of combined chlorine in the water, the reaction of contaminants from the human body, whether that is sweat, urine, lotion, uh, makeup, deodorant, how does that chemical reaction with the chlorine that we use in our swimming pool as a disinfectant, how does that have consequences? So today we're going to be talking about air quality in about 15 minutes. But on Monday, Dr. Blackstock was doing preliminary research for her PhD at the University of Alberta based in Edmonton to look at the ways in which we can measure those urine levels through the undigested acesulfame, which is an, a sweetener, an artificial sweetener that does not break down in the human body. So her research was essentially saying, if I consume pop, uh, candies, cakes, any sort of processed foods with this sweetener, and it's undissolved in my body, unbroken down, then I pee in the pool, what are those levels? How does that impact us as pool operators? And how does that impact the research that's being done about some of the medical consequences of these contaminants in the water? That was one of the other questions that came up on Instagram this morning that I'll be asking our presenter at the end of the show. We always do a Q&A. And one of the questions I've already had this morning on Instagram is, what is the impact of air quality in swimming pools on asthmatics? So is asthma something that people have biologically, genetically, or is it something that could be developed from, from environmental conditions in the workplace? So that is basically the session on Monday. Really, really interesting. A little bit more of a technical and scientific dive into the content. But Dr. Blackstock was a really engaging presenter. She's relatively young and really enthusiastic about the content. So I really appreciated that she really went out of her way to make it accessible, as, but still technical enough for those of us who are interested in the data. So as I mentioned, you can click on the link in the chat box, go to the show notes page. There is no recording as of yet, but you can see the PowerPoint slides that she has provided, as well as some links that I've shared to her research in mainstream press, as well as some great videos that I use when I teach certified pool operator courses to really drive home that piece for our staff that contamination makes our job harder as pool operators. 
So certainly we recognize that people will pee in the pool, people will not shower, people will have makeup on their face. And that's part of our role as a pool operator is disinfecting those contaminants as we enter into the pool. However, what what level of contamination are we dealing with? How does that affect our set points for chemistry? What are our target ranges for disinfection based on the people who use our pools, based on how many people come to our pools? As you can tell, I'm really I'm really into the pool operations side of what I do. So that's a little bit of a, a deep dive into what we did on Monday. So let's talk a little bit about the session that we had on Wednesday. So Wednesday, March 24th, we had a session at an irregular time as well. Let me go ahead and pop the link in the chat box to the session that took place on Wednesday afternoon. So on Wednesday this week, we heard from Ramsey Husseini from Australia. He is located in Melbourne in the state of Victoria. And Ramsey had a really interesting personal story to share with us. Ramsey left Afghanistan as a refugee in the early, I believe it was 2011. Ramsey and his family left Afghanistan in 2011. And they fled to Pakistan before traveling over not overland, <laughs> traveling by boat from Pakistan to Australia as refugees. Ramsey settled in Australia. He did not speak English. He did not know how to swim. He had never lived anywhere with access to an ocean or a beach culture. And Ramsey was involved in the multicultural program that Life Saving Victoria has to engage uh, different role models people of different backgrounds and different cultures and get them integrated into Australian society, as well as educating them about the risks of swimming in the ocean, beaches, water safety and drowning prevention. So Ramsey shared some great information about the process there in Australia for how they engage with different communities. He shared some examples of role model lifeguards that they have trained from different refugee and new immigrant communities. So he shared the stories of two Kenyan siblings. He shared the story of another Afghani. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. It was a really unique name. And then he also shared a story of a Burmese lifeguard. And so creating this program at Life Saving Victoria to engage with different individuals. We often have a tendency, at least in Canada, I can't speak to other areas of the world, but we have a tendency to have maybe just white lifeguards in a certain area. And we don't have the same opportunities available to different demographics, different populations, different social groups. And so that was really the focus of the presentation on Wednesday sharing the multicultural perspectives that different individuals bring to water safety and drowning prevention. It reminded me a little bit of a session that we had earlier this month with Dr. Audrey Giles that was also a really excellent session. Dr. Giles talked about uh, cultural sensitivity in Canada about making water safety and drowning prevention um, relevant to Aboriginal communities in Canada. So statistically, we in aquatics have focused on water safety and drowning prevention at the child level. So the thinking that we have commonly had is that if we teach little kids how to swim and we teach them about safe boating and swimming with a buddy and not swimming at night, traditionally, we have assumed that those lessons will continue on into adulthood and that people will make safe choices as adults. The reality of the situation in certain parts of Canada is that we continue to see high drowning rates and drowning fatalities in older populations. So whether that is young men ages 18 to 29, whether that is seniors or full grown adults, she shared a lot of different information about uh, her work as a doctor at the University of Ottawa and her research on human kinetics and the impact of water safety and drowning prevention programs. So uh, 
Thanks so much for those of you who are here. Uh, let's see those of you who haven't said hello, let us know where you're based. Where are you located in Canada or in the US? Let us know. How is your weekend shaping up? What do you have planned? It snowed a little bit the last couple days, so it is still cold here in, uh, I'm just outside of Calgary, Alberta. I was speaking with a presenter next week in Ontario, and she was saying that it's beautiful, 18 degrees, sunny, Celsius, it's really warm, whereas here today I'm looking out my window and it's this gray, cloudy, probably only minus one or minus two, but still definitely um, March, <laughs> very much March. So thanks to those of you who are here. I see New Jersey, I see Saskatoon, I see Jasper, I see West Virginia, I see a couple other names. So definitely let us know where you are from. As I have mentioned a little bit so far, you can see in the chat box, I have pinned the link to today's session where the PowerPoint slides are available. So if you decide to drop off and catch the recording later, you can go ahead and see the slides that Brent has prepared. So that's included, there's 55 slides that are running us through how does air quality um, how does that bad air get created, as I mentioned a bit earlier with disinfection byproducts? And then how do we test that air quality as well as do our best to maintain better air quality? So I see Jamie's here from Kitchener. I see, oh, I'm just scrolling, Cornwall, Ontario, Loyalist, Ontario. We've got lots of people here today, Casper, Wyoming. So thanks to those of you who have joined us. Those of you who've been looking for recordings, I posted last night on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel, which I will pin in the chat box. We've got the first recording up for the Making Swimming Pools More Accessible to Trans Communities with Caden Seaburn of the Ten Oaks Project in Ontario. So that happened earlier in March. And then coming up on Sunday, I will be releasing Blind Girls Swim 2, which was a session with Kathleen Forrestell from the CNIB Foundation, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. She was talking about her lived experience as a partially sighted person. And that session will be coming out on YouTube on Sunday. Hey, Katie. Yes. Okay. Yay. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. <laughs> let me do a quick introduction and then we'll send you off before the internet gods change their mind. So I'm very excited. <laughs> so let me just read our brief introduction and you can get going. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, give us a little heart failure on Friday morning. <laughs> Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Today is Friday, March 26, 2021. My name is Katie Crysdale, Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. Thank you so much for joining us today. The session Brent is going to be starting is called Indoor Pool Air Quality, Modern Research and Practical Solutions. So I gave a little introduction earlier as to how I met Brent, but Brent's background is that he has 20 years of aquatic experience, starting as a lifeguard and swim instructor, and eventually finding his passion in the mechanical room. For the past 14 years, as an employee at Automated Aquatics Canada, which is located in Edmonton, Brent has had the privilege to help pool operators across Western Canada to optimize their pool water treatment. In addition to being a professional smeller of pool air, Brent's skills include assessing the risk of getting stuck on pool drain covers and figuring out how well a pool system can filter out pool uh, poop particles. In 2020, Brent served on the Filtration and Circulation Technical Committee for the Council for the Model Aquatic Health Code and was an observer on the PHTA 7 Standard Writing Committee for Anti-Entrapment Avoidance. Pool air quality has always been a subject Brent has been interested in and has followed the research for several years. With new technology to allowing for quicker poolside testing of trichloramine in the air, Brent has been able to implement testing plans and control strategies to give insight and results for successful air quality management. 
So definitely want to give a big shout out to Brent. He's been a long supporter of me and our work. And I want to also say Brent has a little sound bite in a news article I have coming out next month from Pool Pro Magazine. We talk about entrapment, which is something that we are both very passionate about. He's very technically knowledgeable at sizing drain covers and ensuring safety devices are installed. And when I was looking for someone to talk about air quality, he was a natural fit at breaking down this massive topic. So I'm going to pass it over to Brent. He's got 55 slides, so it's going to take the time that it takes. If you have to hop off, you can look for the recording in a couple weeks. Thanks, Katie. Great to be here. I did a presentation last week uh, right before lunchtime, and I was talking about poop for an hour right before lunch. So uh, today uh, we're going to talk about pee for the most part. We'll touch a little bit on poop, but a lot of pee today. All right, well, here we go. All right, I'm a pool geek. Uh, Katie did a, an awesome intro. Thank you for, for that. Uh, that's me. Actually, it's a picture of a, a few of my favorite things. My two kids, swimming pool with overflow gutters. That's awesome. And uh, it wasn't a smelly pool. It was good. So that was, uh, that was us pre-COVID, of course. Uh, but yeah, been uh, been doing the pool thing for a while. So everyone's uh, here today to talk about smelly pools. Uh, it's interesting when you talk to people about pools, uh, everyone's familiar with the pool smell. There's a lot of different uh, opinions on what that pool smell means. Is it a sign that the pool's being properly sanitized? Uh, is it is that a comforting smell to you? Everyone's got their own opinion. Or does it smell like, uh, is it uh, chemical badness in your nose? Is it irritating, right? Um, so healthy water sanitized to eliminate the, the germs. Um, so it keeps people safe from, from infection. Uh, but it's not necessarily safe when you look at the long-term chronic risks of uh, what you're breathing in. So, uh, and aside from the health issues, there's also airborne byproducts that promote corrosion of uh, the building. So a lot of metal that's not in contact with the water uh, is prone to, to rusting and oxidation damage. So... A lot of what I've I've ended up researching kind of comes full circle, and it goes back to the World Health Organization. Uh, they've got a really uh, really good document, the uh, guidelines for safe recreational water, um, volume two specifically about swimming pools. So when they break down the risks involved with the swimming pool, there's they've got three categories. So this is a good good place to orientate yourself, whether you're new to aquatics or you've been doing it for a while, because these are just the buckets that the various things can fit into. So we got drowning and injury prevention. I was a lifeguard. I, I know how to pull people out of the pool, but I'm not, that's not my specialty. So drowning injury prevention, uh, it's a whole other world. I, I geek out in the mechanical room doing water testing stuff. So, uh, there's risks to exposure of, of chlorination byproducts. Um, however, those risks in, in a reasonably well managed and maintained pool should be considered small. And that's the, the opinion of the World Health Organization. Um, those small risks have to be set up against the benefits of aerobic exercise and the swim skills that are developed in that pool environment. So if everything's going well, the risk of chemical uh, health risks should be much smaller than the risk of not swimming for, for general health and uh, safety. So a big, uh, big piece here is, is the use of chlorine. So when we look at how chlorine, wh where, what chlorine's doing, it's, 
pretty neutral. It doesn't do anything for drowning and injury prevention. When it comes to microbial hazards, so the germs, the stuff, the living matter in the pool that can carry disease, chlorine's great. The more, the better. It kills it fast. No one's getting infected swimming in 20 parts per million chlorine or pure bleach. However, that third bucket outlined as a, a risk, the chemical hazards, that's where chlorine's a problem. So it's balancing it out. You want to kill things, but you don't want to make it a hazard out of the byproducts gassing off. Um, and, and we can look a little more in depth on the chemical hazards. So I call this problem number one, the chlorine crutch. So chlorine's good, but it's also bad. The, the more immediate risk to bathers is, is, of course, the microbial risk, infection. Chemical hazards can be an immediate risk, right? You can, the chemicals you're handling directly day to day, whether it's chlorine gas or liquid chlorine, um, the chemical itself is dangerous in, in a concentrated form, but also uh, chemical mixing accidents can be a very immediate risk, to, especially to staff. On the other, the other side, there's the longer term exposure risk. So you've got greater exposure risk with competitive swimmers and pool staff. That's where a lot of the research has been. Because uh, the, the part of the equation is what's gassing off in the pool, what level of chemical, and also how, how much contact time do you have? So you got the staff, very long contact time. They might not be breathing as concentrated fumes as swimmers, but the swimmers are in for a shorter period of time, but they're working harder. So their expert uh, respiratory rates are higher and, and they're, take, they're breathing in water right off the surface. So the most concentrated in terms of uh, airborne contaminants. Uh, the routes of entry to the human body uh, are penetration through the skin. So you absorb some of the, these chemical compounds that's estimated at 33 to 40%, but also inhalation of 40 to 67%. So uh, there's some, some good research within the last year that summarized uh, a lot of those findings. Uh, there is a slide with all the referenced research at the end of this, so feel free to dive into that. So good question to ask is why is this more important now than ever before? So there, there's some compounding factors that make this uh, a bigger and bigger deal as time goes on. Uh, back to the World Health Organization, that, that statement there from them about um, weighing the risks of swimming versus not swimming. So as time goes on, there's some things changing that are actually making that chemical hazard the long-term risk more kind of pushing it the wrong way so we've got denser populations more people sharing the same pool space uh you, you don't really see much for air quality issues on very big bodies of water with low bather use right you, you have chlorine but it's not reacting with a whole lot but it's a very different story when you have more people sharing pool space. Uh, COVID conditions for swimming has been very good for pool air quality. It's actually a really good time to benchmark with your existing ventilation system, your existing treatment practices, and low beta load, what, what kind of numbers are coming out off your pool? And then from there, knowing that's a baseline, that's as good as it gets, and then also comparing at a high peak time. So those contrasting, uh, I guess, occupants uh, levels are, are, are pretty important. Pools are more complex now. You don't have rectangular boring pools. Um, you've got water features, a lot of aeration of warmer water, uh, lazy rivers, um, any kind of play structure. Uh, shooting water up in the air, you're you're adding to the, the volatility factor, right? Your things that were in the water are dispersed out of the water, and they they become airborne. Heavier loaded pools, 
a bather activity level. Just, just having a more active pool, splashing, jumping in, all that stuff. It's just like water features. It's throwing stuff in the air. Uh, there's, there's, there's some short-sighted cost cutting at the design and construction stage. So the big one is a lot of pressure to build smaller mechanical rooms. And whatever savings you think you're going to have by cutting your mechanical room size in half, you're paying for it in the long run. The, the compromise to filtration is, is it's hard to, hard to say how important that is long term. And it, and it limits what you can do when you do have problems. So just trying to shave off area of, of a mechanical room to have a smaller treatment system, uh, hard, hard to really say you're coming out ahead with that. There's also a lot more pressure for environmental su sustainability. So the big one is water savings. Um, th there's a cost to that. You know, there's ways to be sustainable and still have a good result. Um, consequences to well-intentioned measures to be green. Um, so things like uh, cutting the uh, fresh air intake on your air handling system, right? That would amplify issues that you're having despite the attempt to, to save energy. Uh, Im improvements with chemical test technology. So that's a big thing that's uh, giving us an advantage these days is, is you used to need lab testing to do anything uh, when it comes to air quality. Um, there's there's poolside testing of trichloramine levels in the air now. So that's something that really changed the game uh, for, for how I approach these types of problems. Um, started about two years ago with poolside test kit. It's still, it's not a simple chlorine pH type test kit. You're doing a one hour air sample. It takes about an hour to do three tests once you have air samples. Um, but it's still, you know, it, it's bringing it to the, the realm of being realistic to implement. Um, it's not so crazy anymore to test your trichloramine levels. And, and the progressive nature of research. So when, when there's a lot out there on pool air quality and, and the stuff that's comes out more recently builds on the previous work. So it's just progressive. Uh, more nuances are being researched and uh, a lot more articulation in terms of what, what variables are being controlled and manipulated. So it's, it's an exciting time for a pool geek, I guess. So we talked about problem number one being the chlorine crutch. Problem number two, we call it the shedding situation. So uh, in the Netherlands, uh, Martin Kooten uh, has done some really pretty, pretty interesting studies on what's coming off of bathers. So to summarize from a couple of his uh, research projects, the initial pollutant release, so someone just jumps into the water, uh, accounted for about 31% of bather pollutant contamination. Another 37% was from continual release. So once they're in the water and, and they're sweating or whatever, uh, and then there's the incidental release. So they factored in about 32% uh, for that. And uh, I have not seen the pool aid presentation from Monday, which focuses on peeing in pools. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to line that one up and, and learn something from there. So Mr. Uh, Kooten's experiments here get pretty technical and uh, I'm just a pool guy, not a chemist or uh, anything like that. But this, this picture I call the sweaty Dutchman. Uh, so this is how they were, they were testing. The guy was wearing basically a wet suit and they, tr they did different conditions, water temperature, exercise intensity, and then they tested what was coming off the, the participants. So all the stuff they were looking, they looked for a lot of things and then they kind of summarized what was most relevant. And that's these, this listing here. The, uh, the takeaway is that people bring in chemical waste, so dissolved chemicals, carbon, nitrogen, 
and lots of floaties. Floaties is my technical term for the sheddings. So this, this table I think is pretty cool. You've got your starting from the top, it's just telling you, you got carbon coming off of people, nitrogen, then urea. That's a big one. Urea is a, a an organic or carbon based uh, bather waste product. Then you've got ammonia. And then the particles. So the particles, the limitation here is, is a, a particle counter. You can't get lower than two micron. So you can see they, they have a range of two to 50 micrometer or micron. Uh, and there's a log logarithmic function there. So that means you just add a lot of zeros and that's how much stuff was coming off people. Then the intact cell count at the bottom saying that of all the particles coming off, a good chunk of them were, were intact cells. So like skin shedding, uh, but there's still a lot of particles that, that weren't intact cells. And that, that has some interesting implications for when we talk filtration. So the, the nature of what's coming off of bathers, we got dissolved chemicals. You can't filter that. Then you got particles. Now the nature of these particles is they're 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 literally floaties. They're not dense. It's not like grains of sand. Uh, and that's where some of the literature regarding pool filtration is is a little misaligned with reality. When you talk about a filter and a micron rating, it's kind of just assuming you got little grains of particles, hard, dense pieces of sand that you're catching. And in, in reality, most of what's coming off people is not, not little grains of sand. It's, it's very light material. So the floaties and, and, and that stuff behaves a little different. So you think about those floaties. So like your skin sheddings, the outer layer of skin, um, you know, the, the, it's kind of a waxy, oily substance, uh, sebum or uh, skin moisturizing factors, all kinds of stuff that shed off bathers. The uh, the nature of that stuff, though, is that when you think about it going through a pool piping system, hits a circulation pump, there's shearing forces there. There's a lot of turbulence, so it breaks that stuff up. And then it hits a, a filter media, so maybe a grain of sand or perlite, and, and some of that stuff scatters into smaller and smaller pieces. And it's not, again, it's not a, a two micron grain of sand or a one micron. It's colloidal at that, at that point. It's, it's being dispersed um, the finer and finer par particles. And that's, that's, that's the whole problem here is, is there's a lot of stuff that goes into the pool that it is undergoing chemical oxidation with chlorine it's not being well, not being removed from the the pool system it's being recycled and it accumulates so when you look at the chemical contamination the big ones are sweat and urine so this chart here just is a simple breakdown of what what's in these things so chemically sweat and urine are are pretty close to the same um to backtrack a little, this slide here, this is kind of the uh, the the joke of the industry about the the, the dye that turns the color when you pee in the pool. Uh, it would probably just dye the whole pool that color in reality because urine and sweat are are very chemically the same. So we're looking at that urea content. Uh, so whether you're sweating or peeing in the pool, a lot of it's urea. Urea. There's a bit of ammonia and a handful of other, other things. And that's where the, the, the whole world of science and disinfection byproducts, chemistry gets complicated because then they start looking at these individual compounds and what happens with this amount of chlorine for this amount of time. It's just chemical chaos. Can't even keep track of it. But focusing on the big ones helps to give a little bit of insight. So urea and ammonia. So that chemical contamination, uh, it's, it's also interesting to see the rate at which it's added to the pool water. 
So water temperature and intensity of activity. This is a continuation of uh, Kooten's research. So the chart on the left, I think is extra cool because before I was a pool geek, I was a bit of an exercise science geek. So this is exercise intensity, that VO2 max at the bottom. It's how hard you're working out. And then on the left is, is showing how much you're, how sweaty you are in the water. So resting, leisure swimming, pretty minimal. Then you, you, you crank up the intensity or an aqua spin class and uh, you're, you're really polluting the pool at that point. And then the chart on the right shows also the magnitude that water temperature has on the, the release of sweat. So it certainly isn't groundbreaking stuff, but still, still a, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, the, the harder you work in the water and the warmer the water, the more stuff is coming off. So it can get a little complicated here. We're talking about, so this urea and ammonia, it's coming off. What happens to it? Well, lots of stuff uh, and we're not even going to get into it, but there's chloramines. That's the big one. Uh, they can be organic, meaning there's, there's a carbon component to it, like urea or inorganic, like ammonia. It's just nitrogen and um, no carbon component. So the inorganic's a little simpler. Y you can really go to town here on other things that are measured. Like there's hundreds of measured disinfection byproducts in various concentrations, but... Uh, yeah, again, it's it, it it then it starts just making things more and more confusing. But uh, each one of those things, you Google swimming pools plus whatever chemical, and there'll be lots of info. If we if we do uh, try to make it simpler and more specific, we're looking more at the volatile disinfection byproducts, which I mean, that's the stuff in the water that turns into a gas. Uh, uh, so there's variables that affect that. Uh, the chemistry is a little beyond me, but to get really specific, the, the one thing that is we can measure easier now than ever before is that inorganic trichloramine. So it's a simpler chemical compound and we can test specifically for it. In terms of bad stuff to measure in the water, dichloramine is, is probably the main irritant to look at. And that's a piece of what you test for with a traditional pool kit, um, where you test for a combined chlorine number, but we'll, we'll get a little more into that in a couple slides. But, but to summarize, your dichloramine is an irritant in the water. Trichloramine is an irritant that gases off. Uh, chloroform, which is a, it's a trihalomethane. Technically, it's trichloromethane. Uh, is present in the water, 2 to 20 times higher than in tap water. And then there's a positive correlation, the higher the level in the water, the higher the level in the air. So when we're talking about these compounds. That, that's where research is still ongoing in terms of what level is safe, what, what's realistic, uh, where's the true hazard. And that's there's so much research on that. Uh, I started throwing that stuff in and then I, I cut it out. It was just, uh, it's a little overwhelming. But there are some places that do have some stricter regulations or, or at least recommendations when it comes to this. Uh, so I'm in Alberta, Canada, just to our west is British Columbia. So in BC, this is out of their work safe BC document, um, which is like an occupational health um, type perspective. And their document was about chloramines in pools and exposure. So their proposed guideline uh, here is is and this is the justification or part part of their report is the proposed guideline and occupational exposure range from 0.1 to 0.5 milligrams 
per cubic meter. So the World Health Organization recommends 0 0.5, but that might be too high uh, as it's documented that a lot of the irritant health effects occur at lower levels. So WorkSafe BC put out 0 0.35 as a recommended limit. So some European countries have proposed a lower guideline for trichloramine um, with indoor pool air. So, so 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. So that's the inorganic trichloramine. The one that's easiest to measure poolside with the, the state of current testing technology. Trihalomethanes are still a, a lab type test. Uh, it's, there's a couple different methods, but it's not something you're gonna be doing poolside in the near future. Um, but trihalomethanes are, are, again, they're an organic uh, disinfection byproduct, so they're carbon containing. Um, and they are regulated as, as generally as a, a total trihalomethane, although chloroform specifically is the one usually associated with, with um, uh, chlorinated swimming pools. So the German DIN standard uh, has a guideline value of 20. That micrograms per liter, um, so a thousand micrograms would be a milligram, so ppm. So this is a parts per billion range. Um, and then there's a, a Denmark has a uh, a limit not exceed twenty five. I believe FINA as well has one. Uh, I forgot what it was. I think it's around twenty. Uh, World Health Organization, I believe, has 100, but um, it's more regulated in drinking water. So as testing progresses, I think, I think eventually we'll start seeing uh, the kind of thing where maybe a daily water test sheds a little more light on on the the situation of, of the byproducts in the water so i just throw this maybe you know years down the road the testing is simpler and easier to do so you test free chlorine and then you're not just doing a total chlorine test for combined chlorine but you're you're separating it out you got monochloramine dichloramine and then you do a trichloramine test in the air and maybe you're doing a a, a chloroform test of the, the water um technology ch changes quickly so that really would be the goal is to be able to take into account those those factors uh and, and uh ha have a record and knowing when when things are getting out of line and how to implement the right controls to change things around So these disinfection byproducts, the, a piece to them is, is volatility. So that's how readily the compound goes from the gas into the air. So trichloramine here has a, a constant value of 435. So the higher the number, the more it's going to, the more readily it's going to gas off. So trichloramine, that's, and that's, such a big piece of this is is we're, when we're talking combined chlorines in the water and air quality that that direct correlation that we want isn't there because we're, we're the thing we're worried about it doesn't stay into the water in in high concentrations uh, and then chloroform the other one that that's the, the primary trihalomethane uh, it's also a fairly high uh, volatility constant there. So a really, really relevant quote I found here. So another researcher just described a swimming pool as being a disinfection byproduct reactor. There's a continual input of pollutants and a continual dosing and reaction of chlorine. And each tr treatment cycle um, just kind of propagates that and, and, and keeps it going. So uh, if you're looking at making disinfection byproducts, this is this is how you do it. You put a lot of chlorine in, put a lot of bather waste and disinfection byproducts. So 
this uh, the terminology with pools and w water quality versus air quality gets gets a little confusing. The the testing we do day to day is more more along the lines of the immediate microbial hazard, right? You want to make sure you have enough chlorine at the right pH and have a good ORP. Things are being killed. The There's a few pieces that, that really don't get factored in. So if we were to talk about what when we're doing a test, what is it testing for? What's it telling us? So you've got active chlorine. That's, we don't really directly test active chlorine, but when you add any type of chlorine to the water, whether it's a gas chlorine or it's a salt water chlorinate or a liquid chlorine, hypochlorous acid, that HOCl, um, you know, this gets discussed uh, pretty in depth with a pool operator course, but that's correlated very closely with your ORP. Then you get your free chlorine. So free chlorine captures, and that's that's just the first part of the test. So if it's a tablet, it's DPD-1, or a, a 1A and a 1B if it's a liquid. It has to be separate in liquid form. Uh, if you use a Taylor kit, they have a DPD-2, but that's not actually true. It's still DPD-1, it's just in two parts. I'd love it if, if Taylor made that update. Um, DPD-2 is actually a real specific uh, reagent and it, it does react with monochloramine. So the, the two chlorine tests we're familiar with are free and total chlorine, the difference being combined chlorine, but the total chlorine test is not just taken in combined chlorines. So it's yeah, um, other oxidant residuals get factored in. Um, monochloramine and dichloramine get lumped together. Monochloramine is usually what's, what a lot of municipalities treat their drinking water with. And it doesn't form trihalomethanes readily. That's one of the reasons why it's used as, as a drinking water treatment. It's not as quick killing as uh, free chlorine, but if you turn, if you dose free chlorine and you add ammonia, you make monochloramine. It's not an irritant and doesn't readily gas off to, to try helimethane. With when the ratio and the dosing are controlled. Unfortunately, in a swimming pool, we don't have control of the ratio of the the nitrogen side, right? That and which is in urea and ammonia from the bathers. We can control the chlorine levels. So with, with all this testing. A uh, good perspective to have is is that we're measuring in parts per million or milligram per liter. The, this is it, so the equivalents here listed a few examples is one minute in two years. That's a part per million, or one inch in sixteen miles. So when you're talking one versus two ppm, we're we're talking about really trace amounts of things. When when you look at air measurement. So nitrogen trichloride or trichloramine in the air, that's usually a milligram per cubic meters. There, there's a conversion. You can take a, a part per million and make it a milligram per cubic meter. In Alberta, we have uh, occupational health code with, with a few different chemical compounds that are related to swimming pools. We don't have nitrogen trichloride or trichloramine in there, but... Uh, you look at chlorine gas, so you got a 15 minute exposure limit, which is one PPM in the air or 2.9 milligrams per, per cubic meter. So obstacles to better air quality. So we have a lot of reliance on traditional combined chlorine. There's a lot of emphasis on, you gotta test your combined chlorine so you know if your air is good. Uh, Dr. Uh, Stottermeister from the German Federal Environment and Agency just sums this up perfectly. There's no direct correlation between trichloramine concentration indoor pool air and the value for the chemical uh, parameter combined chlorine. You can have high combined chlorines. If it's mostly monochloramine, uh, you're not gonna have an irritant and there's 
no air quality issues. You could have a, a seemingly low combined chlorine number, but if it's predominantly dichloramine, you're going to have irritation of, of bather eyes. Um, or you, you could have low monochloramine, low dichloramine. It could all be gassed off as nitrogen trichloride, and those levels could be high. And then you got a problem. So, and that'll change as, as the, the, the testing becomes more readily available. If more pools or, or regulations change to require air testing, that, that'll just change that notion and there'll be more emphasis where it should be, which is testing the stuff in the air. So most test kits also can't differentiate mono from dichloramine in the water. And even monochloramine, although it, on its own, it's not causing problems, it's it's a precursor. Right? It's, it's, an, it's ammonia that's reacting and, and as chlorine levels increase, it reacts more. Uh, and those oxidation reactions continue and the end point is still nitrogen trichloride which is volatile and it gasses off into the air. So you could be, if you do differentiate and you do test what you have for mono versus dichloramine, you, you, you still don't want to be at ease with a high monochloramine because that's still there to, it'll contribute to problems down the road. There's still, still a lot of, I call adherence to traditional methods and uh, anecdotal reasoning. So like the old pH at 7.5 because it's good for the eyes or something. That's not, not in the best interest for air quality. So that's, that's, that's the testing that we're, we're used to seeing, right? It's your free chlorine, total chlorine. And then that, that's that combined chlorine in the middle that it isn't the full picture. Uh, more modern test kits are, are starting to have that as a feature where you have monochloramine and dichloramine in the water can be differentiated. So that's an example of one of them. And part, part of the issue though is, is now we're starting to make water testing a little more complicated. And that's the, uh, that's, I guess that's the trade-off is, is, is it better to be simple and everyone can understand it. Um, you know, what point does it become too, too complicated for, for operators or teaching pool operator courses? So when you, when you start bringing in, in a less straightforward approach, it, 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 it can complicate things. And, um, you know, it's a reason that, that people will, will continue to adhere to the old fashioned practices. So on the subject of combined chlorine, uh, so this this research here kind of shows the magnitude of what levels create problems. So dichloramine and trichloramine or nitrogen trichloride, uh, they're undesirable. Uh, that the the problems with the the odor and the irritation of the eyes uh, for dichloramine can start at 0.8 parts per million and Trichloramine, which not much stays dissolved in water, right? It's volatile, but 0 0.02 is enough to cause uh, irritation in the water. I, I know there's some states and provinces have recommendations for combined chlorine. Uh, some have limits and it, it, it's hard to, to really take a combined chlorine number and say that, well, cause you're, say you're under 0.5, you don't have any air, air quality problems. Uh, you don't want to be complacent and think that your combined chlorine number is good and your pool smelling like a pool is, that's okay. When in reality, you probably got something you're not testing for that's building up. So I got a four step plan to improve your air. So step one. Reduce the contamination. So modern research here, uh, not even gonna try to say the name, Radazak. Uh, showering before entering the pool helps, believe it or not. 
we all know this, but uh, the trihalomethane levels were tested uh, against control group and 27% less trihalomethanes just from forcing people to take a thorough shower. Not bad. Uh, another uh, great piece of research concluded that if swimmers avoided urinating in pools, the air and qu water quality would likely improve. So these, these are low hanging fruits here, but you got to get the buy-in. Another way to look at reducing contamination is, is to think about your pool and the bathers as, as a supply and demand type dynamic. So uh, demand uh, can be controlled by restricting bather load, setting firm limits on this is how many people our, our treatment system can keep up with. Um, that, that'll set you up for success. Is the, a lot of the problems come when a, a pool is overwhelmed and, and the, the degree of contamination being added is, is just too high. And, and as a result, higher levels of free chlorine are dosed to deal with the demand. On the supply side, you can increase supply, which means give better water. So more turnover time before between busy swims, more frequent backwashes. And when I say backwash, I mean filtrate discharge. You don't not a cheat where you some type of filters have a, a bump. That's not a backwash. So you're not discharging filtrate and all that stuff still in there reacting. Don't bump your filters. But um so between peak bather loads, even if maybe your pressures hasn't built up, but you know you're your busy swim and it's been a few days, you, you can backwash before you have to backwash. Uh, that being said, if you've got a, a good filter system, there's a ripening period. So you, you after backwashing, you may want to consider adding a, uh, a coagulant to get that filter to its, its ripened or ready state where it's, it's performing optimally. Just operational considerations to give you more good water and take the bad stuff out. Scheduling of, of brief pool clearings for bathroom breaks. You don't even have to tell people it's a bathroom break. Then they feel like you're telling them to go pee. Might not get the most buy-in, but if, if it's for a safety reason, if you're saying you got to clear the pool to do a bottom check, people, you know, if they're staying on the deck for a minute or two, they might, might be more likely to use the toilet or remind their kids to do it. Uh, the other piece, so aside from pee, we've got, got the sweat component. So encouraging showering between high temperature exposure. So going from a sauna or steam room into the pool, you shower it off first and, and you're, you're, you're taking a good load off. Um, remember that initial pollutant release factor. So get those sheddings off before you go in and accessory cleaning. Those you get pretty gunky, a lot of floaties. On the accessories, I've I've seen it before. A pool with no bathers, you can go throw in a bunch of life jackets and foam toys, and go watch the chemical controller. ORP drops, chlorine goes away just from throwing toys in. So uh, having having a good cleaning plan for for that stuff makes a big difference, and it's just kind of happening happening more naturally now with with the whole COVID era. So step two, enhance the water circulation filtration. So it's a, it's a limiting factor because you're, you're dealing with generally existing facility infrastructure. So whatever you have for water treatment filter system, you have, that's what you, you're stuck with. You got to make the most of it. Um, same thing with the basin circulation and pools needing to run at high levels of chlorine to pass lab samples uh it is usually a deficiency where if, with the basin design you're not having good distribution you got lots of dead spots but cleaning of high contamination areas so surge tank gutters if you have removable stairs all that kind of stuff kind of becomes pockets of chlorine demand where uh creates water quality issues that that cause you to need higher levels of chlorine to do the job. So if all that stuff's cleaned on a regular basis, 
Um, the other problem I've, I've seen with the COVID era, pools not being used is, is when you have a pool with regular usage, the bathers are mixing up the water. So bathers are good for hydraulics. When you have reduced bather loads, you get a lot more dead spots showing their, their true nature, um, algae growth, and just pockets of stagnant water. And, and it, a little bit of chlorine is very effective at, at keeping water clean and safe. But when there's lapses of disinfection, so there's no residual disinfectant, that's where things like algae can establish themselves or, or a, a bacterial biofilm, which is especially notable in intermittent water feature lines. So spray features, hot tub jets, those, uh, when circulation stops, the bit of chlorine that's in the line doesn't stick around for long. Once it's gone, uh, whatever's in there in terms of a, a, a microbe uh, is able to establish itself, develop a biofilm, and then it's resistant to the chlorine that does come in when the circulation resumes. So hydraulic dye testing helps to minimize some of the dead spots. Throw a dye in the pool, you watch it turn purple. Um, then you know you can follow the path of treated water and make adjustments. So inlets should be fine-tuned directionally and with restrictions so that your the whole pool dies evenly. Filter system, can't, can't state the importance of this enough, uh, but inspecting the media condition. So the depth of it, making sure you have a level media surface. Uh, that's the start of a lot of, a lot of issues with pools is that the filtration is compromised. Measuring pre and post filter chlorine demand is, is it's an interesting thing to, to look at with the, the state of a, a filter. The filter starts off as your friend, catching all the, the floaties. Um, but eventually it becomes more and more contaminated. Backwashing gets rid of some of it, but a lot of, a lot of gunk needs to be chemically cleaned. And, and so on new media, it, it's interesting to test chlorine, free chlorine, go, free and to, combined chlorine going in, free and combined coming out and just kind of seeing what's going on in the filter. Uh, another good implementation is, is turbidity monitoring pre and post filter. So this is, is probably next level pool geekiness here, but having a, a device that measures water clarity. So a turbidimeter is measuring turbidity. So how cloudy your water is, the lower the number, the more clear the water is. Again, it's, it's, it's hard to just look at a, a value on a, a, a a pool system and just say, oh, that's that's working good or that's not working bad. It's something that should be tracked if you're going to use it to establish if your filter is working properly. It's something that has to be looked at over long term, kind of like a pressure gauge, right? A pressure gauge, you walk into a mechanical room, it says 20. That doesn't tell you much. You got to know over the course of, so if it's, if it's a pressure gauge on a pump, is it, what was it when it was put in from day one and what kind of flow did you get? You know, 10 years later, with the pressure low and the, the flow's low as well. Like that's, you got to look at the whole, whole picture, but turbidity monitoring is kind of like that, where looking at the trend over time, pre versus post filter gives you that indicator. Uh, correct selection and dosing of, of any filtration aids. So whether it's just a simple clarifier, you throw in the deep end to make it a little sparkly and, and shiny, or if you're doing charged optimized coagulation, flocculation, this, this, this can, well, it does a lot to help you, but it can hurt you. If, if you're not dosing properly, so too much of a coagulant, what'll happen is it'll coagulate in the, the pool basin. Uh, it can settle out in a surge tank or circulation dead spot and not make it to the filter. And then you're not actually helping uh, the problem, right? So if you're dosing a coagulant appropriately, it's so that the filter can remove uh, more contamination. So dosing too much, it, you can, if it's too concentrated when it hits the filter, it'll actually go through the filter. And then you're, you're, you're getting a flock forming in the pool basin. 
Um, so it has to, has to be carefully dosed and adjusted. And that kind of goes back to the turbidity monitoring. If that, that's another indicator that your filtration and coagulations all working well together. So another enhancement is granular activated carbon. So uh, Skabinski here in 2019 studied a few different treatment processes for, for specifically for swimming pool applications and, and activated carbon filtration showed the highest removal of volatile disinfection byproducts. Um, shouldn't, shouldn't really be a huge surprise in the whole world of water treatment. This, that's, I mean, carbon filtration is, is used to take chemical contaminants out of water. Um, almost the entire, uh, amounts of trichloramine, combined chlorine, um, and this one's a, another one, big chemical name, must be bad, uh, can be removed from, from the abs uh, absorption property of, of carbon filtration. Sounds good. On the practical implementation side, uh, that, that's where it gets a little tricky because part of it is is you have to reactivate the carbon. It, gets, it does become saturated. You don't backwash out these, these chemical compounds. Uh, so there, there's a reactivation to keep it working. Um, you could have a full, and, I mean, it also adds some chlorine demand. There, there's a balance there, right? How much carbon do you put into a system? And how much is it helping versus how much chlorine demand does it add? Initial uh, carbon, new carbon will have a higher demand. It does go down uh, over time, but it's something to be uh, aware of. With that being said, the amount of carbon and and then do you do it as a another whole tank in addition to your regular filter system? That gets starts making pool treatment systems bigger, more complicated. So the, 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 the best, the most practical way I've seen it and uh, automated aquatics, uh, we've, we've done a lot of this, is to retrofit a medium rate sand filter that has decent depth to it to function as a multi-layer filter. So you put in, you, you remove a bit of sand that would normally go on the top, put in a select grading of carbon. Um, and that, that could be part of a treatment process that, that handles that removal of chemical contaminants. You can't put it in just any sand filter. Uh, if it's too, too shallow or you're filtering too fast, it's, it's going to actually make your filtration worse. There's an example of a multi-layer filter you can see the carbon layering in there as well as the conventional sand and, and support layers here is the here's the goal um, so we talked about turbidity meters measuring pre and post filtration uh so yes check this out so this chemical controller on the left low chlorine check that out 0.68 and then you got an ORP value, 849. So a little bit of chlorine is doing a lot of oxidation. Uh, to be fair, in this situation, the chlorine isn't working alone. It's got help. But this, this is in line with a lot of European operational practices and standards. The German DIN standard, chlorine has to, should be on a pool between 0.3 and 0.6 parts per million. It's 0.7 to 1, one maximum on a spa uh, as, a, as a recommended range. And then if you hit 1.2 ppm chlorine, shut her down. Get people out of there. It's too high. That's how they run. It's a lot, to, a lot of good uh, takeaways from, from uh, some of those standards where they, are, they have more of an awareness of air quality and there are regulations that drive 
the uh, the result of of less chlorine in the water, but having really good disinfection and having good air quality. So this filtration reading, um, we got 0 0.038. That's pretty clear water going into a filter and then 0 0.019 coming out. Um, this was also, this was a, a low use COVID era pool, but um, I didn't have the uh, a good picture from before, but it's not too far off from even when this teach pool is being uh, readily used. So here's some reasons you need two ppm of chlorine. It's a, I mean, we're all comfortable with that nice Kool-Aid dark shade of pink on our, our test kit, but uh, the more you test for nitrogen trichloride in the air and, and you look at the trends and follow the research, the more you realize that those, those higher chlorine levels, uh, they're not good for the long term. I mean, they're, you got your chemical expense, more chlorine means more pH balancing, more alkalinity balancing. Um, but, you know, then the effect it has on the building infrastructure, corrosion, and then your, your lungs, your health, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, this is a trade-off. So, uh, you got a, a sand filter, uh, picture here. The media is a little on the low side and probably not in great condition. Um, the middle picture here, that was, uh, that was a skimmer weir I pulled out of a condo building and it was infested. So the, the foam inside the skimmer weir, who opens that up? Um, but yeah, pretty, pretty gross stuff growing in there. Uh, and then we have a, a surge tank here that um, this, I tested the highest level of chloramine in my last two years ever. Um, so we talked about that limit of being about 0.5 for recommendation. Uh, I tested about 1.7 in the air above the surge tank. So pretty, pretty foamy, a lot of, a lot of buildup. I mean, surge tank is a place in the system where a lot of the bad stuff goes and there's a lot of localized chlorine demand. Uh, these, this is another example of, of needing to use more chlorine where you have a filter that doesn't actually have all the media coverage to be effective. Um, so the, the, the white solid perlite there is coats some of the, uh, the filter noodles, um, but not, not, doesn't end up evenly distributing and coating them all effectively. Uh, so if you're not filtering or filtering is compromised, more of those floaties are just high, higher, more floaties are moving through the system. So you're contributing more and more to that, that model described by uh, Zweiner as a disinfection byproduct reactor. Anyway, so, so more more back to the research here and optimizing disinfection the step three uh hansen i believe he's uh out of denmark uh really thoroughly studied the impact of ph and if there's going to be a test on this i'd be telling everyone this is on the test swimming pool should be operated with a ph no lower than 6.8 to limit trichloramine exposure and not higher than 7.2 to limit trihalomethane formation. So this is gold. Uh, it, it's it's that balance of of the two different two specific compounds that we're worried about. Uh, so trihalomethane or chloroform. You know that's on it gets accelerated on one end of the pH spectrum, and then and that's the organic. Uh, nitrogen, so urea, which was that was the big component when we looked at sweat and urine, uh, and then the inorganic component, so the uh, nitrogen trichloride, uh, that's on the accelerated on on the other end of the pH range. So that's very achievable. Set your p ideal pH rate in the middle. There's other considerations, of course. There's your uh, carbonate saturation or, or Langlier index uh, with regards to corrosion. Uh, 
I know that's important, um, but I, I'd say the emphasis would be on optimize your, your disinfection, maybe run a slightly lower pH than you're used to. And there's probably more of a trade-off in having better air quality than getting an extra few years on a heat exchanger. Or you can offset other parameters in water chemistry to, to make that balance out. But this is not in line with, with conventional pH recommendations, right? I, I, can't, I can't really remember what gets taught in the, the various courses, um, but I know 7.3 seven, even some has, has been a struggle to recommend to get that lower side. When I started in, in the pool world, 7.5 across the board was everyone's pH. And uh, I, I think it has something to do with the being neutral for the eye fluid, but um, more and more we're, we're, we're starting up pools or upgrading better filtration systems. And one of the operational tweaks we're, we're doing is putting in lower pH set points. And uh, yeah, it's when you, when you start testing the, the nitrogen trichloride, you, you see the, the impact. Uh, assessing and, and reduce the dependency on higher free chlorine levels. So consult your health officials, reference European standards or Alberta here. Um, if you, in Alberta, it's really progressive. It's awesome. We, we have a standard range of, you know, one or two PPM depending on your temperature, but there's also criteria where if you're running your ORP over 700, you can run it, you can allow your chlorine to go down to 0.5 and still have bathers in the water. And one ne the next step is if your ORP is over 770 millivolt and you have some sort of supplemental treatment system, your chlorine can drop as low as 0.3 and you're still allowed to have bathers in the water. So it doesn't mean you want to have your, your set point for 0.3 you still, it just gives you operational buffer when you've got good water treatment practices in place. Um, so, and in do doing that, right, that's, that's some guess and check. How much chlorine do you need to keep your water safe from the microbes um, versus ha having good air quality? So part of an occupational health control for indoor pool air should be to have monitoring. So testing one or two times a year, having a clean oxidation plan. If you're just throwing chlorine in your water and you got moderate to heavy bather load, you're going to have air quality problems. But for all this on the, the disinfection side to be optimized, all those step two strategies need to be in place to set you up for success because those will be limiting factors. Um, you can't get away with lower chlorine levels if your filtration is compromised, right? That's the chlorine crutch. You're going to be reliant on more chlorine to make up for other treatment deficiencies. We talk about clean oxidation. We're oxidizing without chlorine. So we're reducing the oxidative load on the chlorine. And that makes chlorine more effective as a sanitizer. And I, I see this every day, and that's that's that screenshot of that controller where we had to 0.68 chlorine, but an ORP of 850. So there was low oxidative load, a um, little bit of chlorine, really efficient as a sanitizer. Um, good oxidation also it means you're reducing the rate that those pollutants are accumulating. You're getting rid of them. So higher ORP values with less chlorine. Now here's the mechanisms here for clean oxidation. You, you, can, you can dose ozone, very oxidative, right? And all this oxidation, it's all revolves around oxygen um, as a, well, it's an, you know, that's you, an oxidizer and, you know, there's, oxidizers, reducers, there's chemistry that's over my head. I'm more of a cause and effect guy, but um, all I know is you can't just pump oxygen into a pool. Uh, dissolved oxygen is different um, than 
what's going on here. So ozone, right? It's your O3, uh, which is combining the pure the oxygen plus monomolecular oxygen into triatomic oxygen. So ozone in water, really powerful. It's used in aquaculture a lot. So aquariums, zoos, uh, where they need to keep the water clean, but they can't have a, a residual, um, like they can't have chlorine in the water because apparently it's not good for fish. Uh, that's, that's what's ox, that's their oxidizer. That's keeping that water safe for the, the animals. So there's still filtration and other stages that make it different than a pool. I don't know much about it, but ozone is heavily relied on to, uh, help keep the water safe for the animals. Uh, ozone is, is a, a contact point, right? There's a contact tank where it's used. You're not dosing an ozone to spread it throughout the pool. It, 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 I think one, one piece is it's too reactive. It doesn't stay, stick around as ozone in any significant quantity for long enough. So hence the, the ozone contact tank. Um, but so that's one piece. Um, substantial capital to run one of those, a uh, lot of space in the mechanical room. So there's some serious trade-offs for, for your water treatment. And there's, there's other methods that are, in my opinion, are just more practical to would do better or, um, yeah, for better for without all the, the extra expense and, and upkeep. Uh, there's a way to do ozone, right? If, if it's going to be implemented, there's, there's some best practices where if you're gonna cut corners, uh, it's, it's not worthwhile doing. There's hydroxyl oxidation. So this gets into the world of advanced oxidation processes. And this is, this is newer to me. I've been trying to, you know, follow the research and the, and there's different ways of getting your hydroxyls. One of the mechanisms, uh, well, even standard ozonation, one of the, there are hydroxyl radicals as as part of the degradation of the ozone. So um, that's a piece of of the ozone equation. But there's also other ways of getting your hydroxyls. Different brands do different things with or without UV. Um, hydrogen peroxide can be used, although hydrogen peroxide is a, a, a dechlorinating agent. So um, the one I'm, I'm a little more familiar with here is potassium monopersulfate. The trade name is oxone, not ozone. It's an X instead of a Z. So oxone, it's a patented chemical it used to be DuPont that owned it. Uh, it's Lanxus now pretty much every brand of chemical that has a chlorine free shock is using oxone. It's very established, uh, potassium monopersulfate. It's, it's when it's added to the water, it's giving you something called active oxygen. So again, it takes over the oxidation, uh, it, and it's, it's a shock treatment. So you're still, you're applying it, um, you know, once a week or as, as combined chlorine numbers dictate. The, the third one, uh, is what, uh, I saw in the chat, someone had asked. What are my thoughts on hydroxan? Uh, hydroxan is, it's an oxidizer. It's not as potent as, as ozone, but you can dose it and it's a residual throughout your whole basin, which is the advantage with it. And it's not a shock treatment. So it's, it's a little more proactive. So when you talk a little more in depth on, on the clean oxidation practices, not the chemical based, maybe the more the technology based ones. So ozone, the way to do it is that you need a contact time size to have a two to three minute um, contact time. So, and the, the residual one to 1 1.5 PPM. So the German DIN standard has some different exact ranges depending on the temperature of the water, but, but it needs to be full stream and that's, that's how it's done. So you need your generator, 
some substantial capital there. And then you need a contact tank, which is almost like having another filter system. And then you need to de-ozonate, which is another basically another filter tank and it has to vent ozone to the atmosphere. You need ozone detectors, just like you'd have a chlorine gas detector because you're making a toxic gas. The, the, in Alberta, at least the limit for exposure to ozone is like 0.3, where it's chlorine, it's 1.0. So ozone's highly toxic. The research on ozone does show there's, there's trihalomethane formation as part of the process with chlorinated water, but a substantial decrease on the organic matter. So it destroys things, um, living things, right? Bacteria or whatever, all, and the non-living things. It breaks them down. Uh, ozonation on tap water to fill pools uh, showed a, a trihalomethane reduction. So I think that part of that would be because a lot of incoming tap water is chloraminated, right? You've got your monochloramine. Um, so the ozone helps deal with that. And then the water you're filling your pool with is pre-treated to be not working against you as much. Ozonation of pool water. Uh, so it increased the trihalomethane formation. Uh, it accelerated more with each pass is how the study was done. So this was Hansen, uh, work he did in 2016. So the ozone degrades to hydroxyl radicals. So that kind of goes back to those advanced oxidation processes where hydroxyl radical formation is the, that's the active compound you're trying to make and, and get into the water. Uh, so there's some different similar mechanisms there, hydroxyl versus ozone. Um, not a lot of ozone in pools though, to be honest. So, um, so there's some similarities in that AOP oxidation. I don't know enough about it. Like I said, there's a few different brands. They do it different ways. The thing I, I haven't really found good answers on is where on ozone, you have a contact tank with a contact time and a, a dose you can measure uh, an ozone level. The, the hydroxyl is a little more vague and you know, almost uh, mystified because there's not much work on what, what kind of contact time or, or dosing residual do you need? They're, they're, it looks like they're sized based off your pool volume or flow rate. Um, but again, it's not something that's really as measurable. And, and it's a little newer. And I think more and more brands are, are jumping on the AOP bandwagon and putting something out. And uh, it, it obviously does some good. But in terms of the, the magnitude and the, the cost benefit, I don't have any any experience to, to speak to that. But those, uh, those generation equipment, so on the right here, we have an example of a, uh, a commercial ozone system, your ozone generator and a contact tank. Then there'd also be a, the deozonation part of the system. Uh, and then on the left is an example of the, one of the advanced oxidation processes. So either way, you're making something that is a very temporary residual at a point of application. So the, the, uh, it's not circulating through your pool system. Within the German DIN standard, it acknowledges ozonation can be pre or post filter. Uh, pre filter seems to have some some benefit to to taking some load off 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 the filters, right? You're you're destroying some of the the organic matter before it it, it gets that's caught in. You're making it breaking it down into its more inert components. So on the chemical side of clean oxidation, this is the monoprosulfate. Every pool chemical line, uh, whether it's for commercial pools or backyard hot tubs, they all have this. It's oxone, monoprosulfate. The dosing is about 12 to 18 ppm as a shock dosage for a pool uh, or 30 to 60 ppm for a hot tub. So you add it, it, it more readily oxidizes the the floaties and the the bather waste 
uh, relative to chlorine. So chlorine's still oxidizing, it's still in there, it just takes some of the load off as, as a shock, kind of more of a reactive shock dose. Uh, I've, I know uh, of a couple instances where it was tried as you mix it in a tank and you pump it in. So you always have a little bit going, but it's the, the active life is measured in hours once it's mixed with water. Uh, depending on some other water chemistry components, it's shorter or longer, but um, it, it pretty much has to be used as a shock dose. You can test for it. Some test kits um, have an add-on reagent that you can actually test the level of monoprosulfate or sometimes known as active oxygen in the water. So you can know if your treatment, your dose was enough to do the job. Uh, there's a, there is an interference with the DPD-3. So if you're testing combined chlorine, because DPD-3 is not, is just from that other slide, it tests for a lot of stuff, including other oxidizers in the water. So it will register this on it. So if, if you are dosing this and you're questioning your combined chlorine levels, they'll be off for, for a good day. Um, they'll gradually come back down. So you dose this, your combined chlorines look high, but then they go down on their own. And then eventually they get to a point where they, they go up again. And that means your oxidizer is gone and you're back to making your combined chlorines are increasing. Uh, the hydroxan. So this is a component of, of the, the Wapatec process. Uh, so that's TCDO and that's, a chemical additive, but it's dosed to the the uh, treated return line, and you get your oxidant residual from that. A mindering pump and a tank. So we'll go to what I call questionable attempts at clean oxidation. Uh, Breakpoint chlorination. Uh, it it it's still pretty established as a method, but I I don't think it's the doing what people want it to do. Uh, and part of the, the reason I think it's been, it's stuck around so long is that our testing it, because of the deficiencies with water testing. So breakpoint chlorination, it, it's adding more fuel to the fire. Uh, chlorine and bather waste is bad. So when you have more chlorine, it's not really helping. It's, it's, it's accelerating the problem. Uh, this is not preventing anything bad from happening. So you get a false sense of confidence that your combined chlorine has improved. Um, so it's true, your monochloramine, the amount of it reduces, but then you remember that the dichloramine is a problem at a lower level than monochloramine. So depending on how high the chlorine goes and how long, that monochloramine is getting driven into dichloramine. That's just a st one stage of the reaction. The end stage is trichloramine. So in breakpoint, when you do the breakpoint treatment 10 times the combined chlorine dose, you're just accelerating all the reactions. Um, so inorganic nitrogen is driven to trichloramine, where, at which point it's not in the water anymore. So your combined chlorine drops in the water, but it's because it's all in the air now. The reality of pool hydraulics limits how effective this can be. So even in a perfect you know, chemistry scenario where you have the right ratios to ensure it all goes to an endpoint. Um, pools don't, there's a, a lag time, right? The pool's not circulating evenly. So you're going to have areas that aren't going to that endpoint. And, uh, and even after, so then your chlorine levels are high, you got to bring them back down. Once they're down, there's still reactions happening that are contributing more more of the bad stuff into the air the the, the one piece about it that, that really seems out of line to me is that the procedure is done without air monitoring for the the staff and building occupants so these mm -hmm. um and I, part of this is because I've, I've had the privilege of doing trichloramine testing and, and looking at bather loads and free chlorine levels uh, and seeing that correlation, you know, ba more bathers in the water uh, or higher chlorine levels just means more, more trichloramine in the air. So doing these treatments, usually it's, it's at night. Uh, 
but still staff are are there. They've been breathing, you know, moderate levels of trichloramine all day, and then they then they're exposed themselves to these these surges of, of higher levels. It's it's there's probably some long term consequences there. Uh, and then organic nitrogen, so that's that big urea component that's coming in from sweat and urine. It doesn't respond to breakpoint because it's it's a different uh, chemistry or out there. So I'll summarize and go on the record mm -hmm. saying breakpoint is broken for pool use. So in the case of inorganic nitrogen, the theory is you, you have ammonia. And remember from the sweat and urine breakdown, there, was a, there wasn't a huge amount of ammonia. It was mostly urea. So ammonia, it, this theory, this is, it works in a water treatment plant, right? You have free chlorine. Uh, you dose an exact amount of ammonia. It, it, you know, that's how you make your monochloramine. Um, you continue that reaction with the appropriate ratio and eventually it gas off in theory, nitrogen gas and it's, it's harmless. Um, so a, a more, but this assumes you're starting with ammonia. A more realistic scenario is that you're starting with monochloramine and the chlorine amounts being added are excessive and they drive the reaction too far and the endpoint is nitrogen trichloride. So you're getting nitrogen trichloride from your breakpoint, not nitrogen. So I summarize this from uh, Mr. Ed Lightcap, uh, who has had a, a several really good uh, chemistry presentations uh, for a number of years. So thank you, Ed. That's was able to simplify the, the science a little bit there. So that was inorganic. So we're talking monochloramine, ammonia, just nitrogen and chlorine. But the, the, the big component of chemical contaminants in a pool is organic nitrogen. So urea has carbon with the nitrogen. It's a different chemistry uh, here. And it's complicated. There's a whole paper from uh, Mr. Blachley there on like a whole research paper about this. There's a lot of stages and uh, uh, his summary uh, is, is that's really all you need to know here. I don't, I can't follow the chemistry. Urea represents a reservoir for the formation of nitrogen trichloride and other compounds. That just captures it perfectly. So urea is a reservoir of trigloramine. And it doesn't, breakpoint doesn't work on that. It's not ammonia. It's uh, uh, when you apply more and more chlorine, these other reactions happen. Lots of things come off, but more nitrogen and trichloride is one of them. This is, this is uh, more Blachley's work here. So it's showing as the urea is chlorinated with more chlorine, it's uh, on the right here. And for longer periods of time, that nitrogen trichloride really takes off. But as that takes off, you are getting less mono and dichloramine in the water. So your combined chlorine numbers look better. But that's the trade-off. And may maybe that's, maybe it's worthwhile. I don't know. I'm just, just trying to be clear on what is happening. Uh, yeah, for, I guess, questionable attempts, the next one here is ultraviolet dechloramination. So ultraviolet does is usually gets promoted as a, a alter, or secondary sanitizer, right? You're able to kill things like cryptosporidium with a quick pass under a UV bulb uh, quicker than a chlorine would kill it. There's also claims that you reduce combined chlorine. And that's certainly true. Um, and to summarize uh, research from Skabinski a couple of years ago, um, the removal across the treatment train is not feasible. The mechanism of using UV to treat combined chlorine is um, photo photolysis. It's probably the wrong term. I've read it lots, but I've rarely said it. So you break the chlorine nitrogen bond. So the chlorine and nitrogen, they're together. They're a combined chlorine. The light 
uh, severs that bond and then the nitrogen is freed up again. So across the treatment train, yes. However, it reforms in the basin. So it's, is it reforming faster than it's being um, separated? I don't know, but um, the, the research summary here, well, there is an increase in chlorine demand. So that's a trade-off of having UV running. Again, you would argue that it's killing chlorine resistant pathogens faster. So that, that might be a fair trade-off. Uh, research out of France, uh, 2013, was a, no, a list of disinfection byproducts where the formation increased. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, so out of that, in France, 2018, new rules were implemented where, where you have uh, UV lights installed for chloramine removal or dechloramination. You're required to test trihalomethane in the water at least once a month. Nitrogen trichloride and trihalomethanes have to be tested in the air twice a year. You still have to respect the 100 uh, micrograms per liter as a limit of trihalomethane in the water. And you're prohibited from reducing your fresh water addition um, just for the sake of reducing it because you think you have a better treatment system now. So a lot of skepticism out of uh, some research in France with, with these stricter rules. So this is for, these are extra rules for if you're running UV. Uh, again, the, not saying UV is good or bad. It's just acknowledging that there seems to be some other things coming off. Uh, despite the combined chlorine number in the water looking lower after the UV bulb, uh, there's other things going on that could mean it's worse for your chemical exposure, although it's giving you benefit on microbial control. If you've got chlorine resistant pathogens in the water that are not getting filtered out, then the UV is going to finish them off. So that's all. That was a long winded step three to my process there. Step four, ventilation system performance. So uh, this, you, you got to look at where this falls. Um, ventilation you don't want it you need it it's critical you need fresh air intake you need air movement you don't want it to cover up a problem um, so focus on what's in the water first and then look at the system that deals with moving the airborne contamination as long as you've got uh, a halogen chlorine or bromine in the water there's going to be some degree of undesirable chlorine oxidation Right? You can't stop the chemistry from happening. You can shift it away and take load off, but you still got chlorine, you still got dirty people in the pool. So there's still got things coming out off there. And um, and I've done some, uh, did recent benchmark testing on a facility where they had no bathers. Well, they had low trichloramine levels, um, you know, less than 0.1, which is good. That's a benchmark. You know that nobody in the pool, things are good. And then if things stay good when your pool's busy, that's great. Things are working. But if the levels are become unacceptable, then you have to look at, well, where where do we balance it out? How do we control the level of chlorine and the beta load so that our levels aren't getting too high? It's possible you could have very high trichloramine levels with no bathers. It's unlikely, but that would be a symptom of something else wrong in your system, localized contamination. Um, there's some recommendations, ASHRAE, um, bringing in outdoor air, air movement, air exchanges per hour. These, these should be established with the building design, but they couldn't be, uh, if you're trying to cut energy costs, reduce fresh air intake, um, these can have negative effects if you're not meeting these minimum standards. Uh, most ventilation systems try to limit air velocity across the pool surface because the higher velocity, 
results in cold swimmers. So they get a little chilly as the move air, air is blowing across the pool. Increases evaporation, which also increases the rate of trichloramine release. So even though you're blowing air faster across the surface to get rid of contaminants, that actually creates more trichloramine uh, gassing off. To optimize system performance, we go to ASHRAE's uh, research with, from Baxter, and they talk about source capture and exhaust strategy. So this is where just being strategic with your handling system, you, you're pulling low level, heavier air slowly, where it builds up across the pool surface, that vents to the outside, and then your actual air handler is recirculating at a, at a higher level. So it takes advantage of the, the denser trichloramines. So poolside testing, it's my, my fun little test kit. Starting in the far right, that's a little sample, air sample pump, you run that for an hour, you pull it through some special cassettes that can absorb trichloramine, and then you use a uh, photometer and you get a little kind of a brownie color, the darker it is, the more trichloramine you have. So you got a one hour sample of air, takes about an hour, you can knock off about three tests. It's a slow process, a couple, couple of reagents, a lot of titrating, feel like a mad scientist doing it. Uh, this was one of my first, uh, first job, uh, projects doing before and after testing. Uh, so in about two months, it had levels that were on the higher side and this client had a history of air, air quality complaints. So we got it tested. We assessed it that, yeah, it's a little on the high side, right? 0.5 is the World Health Org uh, recommendation. Bunch of strategies implemented in two months, same sample locations, same bather loading, um, way better air. So what about outdoor pools? We'll touch on them. So ventilation rates are favorable, right? You don't have, you're not recycling air. Um, so less risk to staff. There's still, still, it's the swimmers that are breathing off what's gassing from the water. So still potential uh, for long-term exposure, but it's, it's greatly reduced. Uh, and then the use of a stabilizer, cyanuric acid has impact on two dynamics. So your active chlorine, that HOCl in, in the red box there is very low. Um, most of your chlorine is not active. So where it's cyanurate bound chlorine, it's a different different chemistry. So it, it kind of mitigates some of the those reactions in the first place. So the trade-off is your chlorine is less effective as a, a sanitizer because it's less effective as a sanitizer, it's less reactive and the, the, the chemistry involved is different um, than described earlier. So the uh, other piece to that, uh, and this is research uh, with Richard Falk, uh, the formation rate of disinfection byproducts, so the rate and quantity of nitrogen trichloride uh, is related to the hypochlorous acid concentration and not the free chlorine level. So the free chlorine, uh, if you go back to that terminology slide, the free chlorine test takes a, has a few things accounted for. And the, the nitrogen trichloride is more related to the active chlorine, the HOCl, not the actual free chlorine. So that changes the dynamic a little bit. And uh, that brings us to our conclusion. Wow, thank you for sticking with me there. Um, summary points, I, I, I ripped off uh, Mr. Ed Lightcap here who had done some chemistry research. And um, when I was looking through material, I, I couldn't help but not reuse uh, his summary points here. I, I, uh, yeah, using chlorine responsibly, supplementing with non-chlorine oxidation, educate the swimming pu publics, right? You got to get buy-in from people swimming in the pool to, 
know, take responsibility and parents to look out for putting their kids on the toilet. Uh, and let's create a more sustainable future for swimming. Let's get all the health benefits and not have our pools smell like smelly pools. So thank you. I love questions and feedback. So let's that's leave that me. up for a moment. <laughs> yeah, uh, my, I want to say, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say a last slide. There is all the references. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram as a pool geek. I will try to do more on Instagram. I was going to say, I clicked on the link on your Instagram yesterday and it was from last year's webinar. So that doesn't give us a, an indication that you're very active, but I know it's been a bad year. The number of pools, like I used to post pools all the time and now I never post pools because I don't get to go to them. Yeah. Yeah. You got to reach into the archive. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for staying with us. I know this was a longer presentation, but I do appreciate Brent's thorough nature with this material. And it's a really good reference presentation. I know there's going to be a lot of interest in rewatching the recording, especially in small snippets. For me, especially as you were talking, I had a gazillion different tabs open because you mentioned a lot of different resources and a lot of different researchers that I'm less familiar with. And so going down that rabbit trail of, you know, well, this leads to this and this leads to this. So I want to thank you for a session that uh, went deeper than a lot of sessions do, but also, you know, in a way that is helpful for people who may not have had the opportunity outside of a pool operator class or building engineering experience to really dive into this topic. Um, anybody has any questions, pop those in the chat box. I'm just looking at my notes to see what I have. Had a lot of great takeaways. I, I particularly enjoyed uh, talking about some of the some of the downsides that I think people people don't realize how significant they are. Like you said, with regards to sustainability initiatives, whether it's lead designation for a building or a culture in Canada about recycling and being green, that water savings with pools especially can be really dangerous in terms of this application, this topic you've been discussing, but just in general, right? We, we have to throw out water sometimes. We can't just save water. Yeah. It, it, when you think about it, um, you know, the, uh, the thought of wasting water, I don't even know if it's fair to call it that. Like when you put water down a, a sanitary sewer drain, it's 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 coming back it's getting treated um you, you hear about some some places putting in their own systems to treat uh used water like uh, i don't know of any it's just colleagues and discussion for other countries but you, you hear about systems put in to reclaim backwash water or other water used in a facility you're basically you're just you're putting in the infrastructure to have a mini water treatment plant which you got to look at is that more sustainable than using a using the infrastructure in place to just send it water to a proper uh water treatment plant um anyways that's yeah, it's kind of it's worthy of discussion discussing and acknowledging that yeah your water that goes down the drain uh, for dilution, it's not really the the only waste or, or I guess energy expense. I I would argue is is that to reheat water. Mm -hmm. Well, and I appreciate your perspective because you're right. I mean, in theory, the fact that we're bathing in water that we could be drinking is for some people going to be considered a waste, right? So recycling it, reusing it. I mean, it it really is a matter of language and perspective and understanding. Like you said, how can we um, how can we repurpose the water? How can we redirect it to responsible ways to consume it? I want to get to a question we had in the chat box about building codes. So in general, for people, if you're looking for more information on air quality for pools, ventilation, uh, on the show notes for today, you will see that I have linked the ASHRAE standard. So that's an international organization for air quality. Also, Brent mentioned the German DIN standard. I will make sure we get that uploaded. Supplementally, I've added a link in the chat box to a generic resources page we have on the Lakeview Aquatic Consultants website, which includes your provincial health regulations, as well as guiding documents like the Model Aquatic Health Code, which Brent was part of the committee revising that. That has some excellent appendices and documents regarding air quality as one of the topics that is covered 
as well as the Alberta Building Code or any of your provincial building codes. Those of you looking for those building codes, uh, usually it's a big tome in your municipal city office and it's a lot of money to buy it. But we're starting to see in Canada, electronic access is available if you register through the right pathway. So Brent was actually the one who told me this, that you can register to access the Alberta building code. You have to go through the registration process and it might take a couple days to get into the system, but then you can actually access portions of the document that you need. Uh, we have a question from Marjan. Uh, what types of pollution has the most effect on clarity of the water? So in your experience, Brent, what types of things are visibly creating turbidity or color or what are you seeing? Oh, just dirty people. I, I don't know if that's a good answer. Um, but, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's what's coming off the bathers. Um, and the deck, uh, you know, you, you look at the, the custodial practices at, at a facility and, um, even, you know, sometimes some water, some water quality, uh, mysteries have been solved watching deck camera footage of janitorial, <laughs> uh, staff, um, rinsing their mop buckets in pools yeah. and just in generally, you know, rinsing the change room and, and deck water into the, the pool is really bad. So that's, yeah, those are the kinds of things that you, you almost assume don't get done. It seems really avoidable, but it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the, the dirt from the deck, the dirt from the people, again, that, that showering principle is, is key. Uh, it's, it's a tricky one. There's different mentalities in Europe than here where, you know, when you're trying to tell, tell someone to take a shower, uh, come from a lifeguard, you know, some people don't take kindly to that. Um, you're, you're calling them dirty. How dare mm -hmm. you tell me I need to shower? Um, whether, or it's more, I guess the European mentality is more, more ownership and not putting bad things in the water. Mm -hmm. That'd be my, my summary. Um, yeah, I definitely agree that I there's I think the front end is a big component, uh, whether that's enforcement and showers, education, signage, membership, literature, really having people connect the dots, the healthy swimming portion of the Center for Disease Control in the United States. I'll post a link on the show notes. They have some excellent graphics that you can download, such as the what uh, what's in my cannonball, which is an illustration of the amount of pee feces, sweat, you know, makeup that comes off the human body into the water. And certainly prevention is a lot easier than uh, treatment. Um, I want to get to Jill's question, and then we'll circle back to the filter question Marjan had. So Jill's asking about pH in the pool and recommended ranges. So she's mentioning that she the ideal range in her location, or she's been recommended to go with 7.4. Is that too low? So my comments initially, and then I'll pass it over to Brent, is that that is not too low. There is a general tendency to think higher pH is better. And my experience as someone who's worked with students across Canada is that it is really connected to that, that old fable that the human eyeball prefers a higher pH, which may be the case for your eyeballs. But when you're talking about the sanitation, the disinfection, the efficacy of chlorine, the presence of hypochlorous acid, the lower pH, the better. Not so that you burn people. We can't go down to really, really low pH, but certainly the lower, the better. You know, 7.2, 7.1, as much as you can balance the chemical cost of maintaining that lower pH, right? pH rises with dirty customers, but then also the efficacy. What set points, Brent, are you seeing your commercial customers targeting for pH in general? Us. Uh, 7.0 where where possible and if you know there's no other issues um water balance wise uh, like you said mm -hmm. there, there's there's a, a higher cost for most pools to run that lower ph mm -hmm. um it's it, it gets amplified if you're you're um if you have a higher ph chlorine system mm -hmm. right because then you're you're fighting a more extreme ph range and then the alkalinity that inevitably goes with that. 
um, the, uh, but yeah, that, that work by, uh, I believe it was Hanson there talking about, you know, not lower than six, eight, not higher than seven, two, uh, you know, that's, yeah, uh, kind of plays to how, how, you know, I've, I've, you know, automated aquatics and my, my colleagues there have, have approached pH ranges in pools uh, and trying to get those higher ORP values. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The, the, one of the other limiting factors though, a lot of times is with, with, if you have a lot of metal pool equipment, so heating equipment, so pool heaters, or it's a direct or indirect heat exchanger, um, or pumps that are metal. Uh, a lot of the manufacturers in their warranty documents might say you need to run at least 7.2. It gives their equipment extra buffer against chemical corrosion. So, uh, some equipment manufacturers will argue against the lower pH ranges because they don't want their equipment to fail. Mm-hmm. There's other factors that contribute to the, the corrosion, you know, higher chlorine levels. Most manufacturers, they say, if your chlorine goes above five ever, your, your warranty is void. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's another consideration to balance out is, is, you know, are, are you on the hoop? You know, if you've got a one-year warranty, you know, the chances of it being invalidated or you having a problem just based off running a slight lower pH. I mean, seven is neutral, right? You're not mm-hmm. truly corrosive, but it's those other factors of water chemistry. So. Yeah. And obviously every state, every province in Canada is different. Even Alberta's pH range is different from BC and Saskatchewan, the provinces on either side. And so to take a a nuanced approach to what Brent's been saying, we can't tell you what's perfect for your pool, whether you're a a university high performance pool with a few athletes swimming long hours per day, whether you're the large community pool with lots of kids and diapers and, and unshowered children you're going to have to really navigate what works for your facility, your infrastructure, your budget when it comes to chemicals. And a big piece is what Brent said, that many, even experienced pool operators, I encounter this when I teach operator classes, many pool people do not understand that fundamentally most forms of chlorine, not all, but many, do cause a rise in pH because inherently the chlorine itself is a high pH product. So your chlorine is going down with dirty customers and the pH is going up with sweaty, dirty customers. Simultaneously, we're doubling down, adding more chlorine to make the water safe. And that is also causing a pH increase, which is then in some ways decreasing the efficacy of that chlorine. So it's a lot of factors to navigate without even getting back to what Brent said earlier, aeration, jets, bubbling, waves, splash dumping buckets, water guns, uh, you know, different currents. It's a really complex, dynamic and changing situation overall. Um, uh, Last question I want to get to, last chance for questions in the chat box. There was a question earlier, Brent, that I think is valuable. Um, Talking about filter types, different filters obviously have different filtering capacity in terms of the size of debris that can be filtered out. So we would say, for example, that a diatomaceous earth filter, DE filter can filter out smaller particles than a cartridge filter or a rapid rate sand filter. How do you see filtration as part of this air quality problem? Do you see a lot of gaps in filter maintenance or how people are using filters that could help them? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, uh, kind of back to that micron comparison, there, there's, I guess, people really gravitate towards wanting to say, yeah, this filter does five microns, that filter does two microns. Um, on, on the f- one side of filtration is, is, is um, related to fecal uh, risk management. So cryptosporidium being a three to five micron uh, protozoan oocyst. It's filterable, but most pool filters don't do a good job of that. Uh, so, so some some of the research from James Ambergie has indicated that although the claim of, of a, a pre-coat or DE filter has a finer media and it can capture a f- finer micron size is in terms of being a straining medium, the the thickness of the media and the ability to have an even coating across the whole mm-hmm. filter area are limiting factors. 
uh, hit, hit like this. So when we're talking filter types, the so, so you're just looking at granular filtration. You've got depth filtration, which is sand, right? You've got bigger spaces between the particles, but you've got a depth to them. And then you've got on the other end of the, the spectrum, the a, a pre-coat filter. You have shallow media, but finer. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the physics of filtration, there's there's an area that studies something called L over D, which is basically it's equating a grain size and a depth from filter to filter. And uh, so, you know, and then there, there's a yeah, yeah, for mine, what's the, so is my, micron, mm -hmm. in micron speak, DE, is it? It's considered the best. In the, yeah, pretty much, what, four, is three. Okay. Yeah. And then it all always comes down to, well, how fast is it worth filtering? Mm -hmm. Those are those are all variables. And then in, in the CPO book, is it 10 micron for a sand filter? No, I mean, I mean, every, yeah. as you know, every manufacturer has a different, what they say that it can do, but typically we're saying sand is around 30, cartridge is around 15. But I think you've already partially answered the question in the sense that I hadn't fully probably been considering the factors, like you said, how are we using the equipment? You can buy anything that claims to do anything, but if you don't maintain it and you don't, uh, you know, uh, correctly follow instructions like the coding you mentioned on the DE if it's not fully coded it's not going to achieve uh, a micron filtration of four it's going to achieve maybe 12 right and that's a factor that should be more at play when people are thinking about these things yeah so the 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 usis with crypto um so there's one thing is to catch it another thing is to retain it Right. Uh, that's where, so in, in your, some European countries, not every country, country in Europe would oh, allow a pre-coat or DE filter Right. where they do allow it. They, you can't interrupt the flow. You can't bump it. You can't stop the flow right. so that the media falls off and the contaminants recoat because your stuff's getting through. Um, or it's recoding onto a shallower layer of the media, which is why it's more likely to work its way through. <coughs> um, so yeah, the it's it, it's really hard to just give that say that's an accurate way of assigning efficacy of a filter. Um, so back to the whole fecal thing is uh, the there's really good pool research out of the UK. So the pool water treatment advisory group. <laughs> Their study for crypto on filters was it's pretty hard to ignore where they talk about like they're comparing sand filtration. And and the fact is when you're talking to those grains sizes or microns, the uh, <coughs> you can catch a certain percentage uh, with each pass. Um, some of it inevitably gets through. Their their research was on using a, coagul a chemical coagulant, which with conventional sand, uh, you know, could take 99 plus percent of, of a crypt cryptospore-sized particles out of the water and retain it to be backwashed mm -hmm. out. Um, so that's got, yeah, that, it's it's hard, hard to argue with that. But then going back to the, the discussion today, we're not just worried about particles in the water. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, there's the light floaty material that's coming off people. There's the chemical waste. Uh, I mean, the only way, the only thing I've come across that handles the chemical waste is, is to supplement with some granular activated carbon mm -hmm. and then to have, have an oxidation process that's, you know, dealing with it as it gets captured. Well, and in general, we could say it's with any pool for any condition, just really having a proactive maintenance schedule and really understanding your pool operations and what pitfalls your specific equipment based on your pool age or your pool infrastructure. What does that look like to ensure that you're capturing as many contaminants at as many possible places, that the disinfection and the oxidation are working in partnership with the filters doing the filtration, which is working in partnership with you know, water balance and chemical dosing and air quality. It's a whole big picture piece. And I do think that filters are often an area I've seen, and I'm sure you've also seen, Brent, that people are 
you know, understand, they're not understanding the maintenance that's required in terms of changing out filter media, whether that's sand or cleaning out filters or dumping DE or perlite, cleaning the the pit, right? There's so many elements that we could we could discuss about that also making incremental a bit small, but assisting a bigger problem. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of moving pieces. You know, it's not just one one part and you can have the best designed filter system and everything, but if if the maintenance is lacking, it's that you're not you don't have an advantage. Um the uh like even even the I don't know, just the notion of what's what's a good filter run. I mean, uh, I when I used to work for a, a municipality where we had um, you know a vacuum DE filter system. There was like a badge of honor that ah we made it six weeks on that filter on that's high five. That's great. Right. And you know looking back now, oh that probably wasn't great for water quality. Uh, you know at that point that's a lot of that's a lot of bather stuff you're holding on to. Um, mm-hmm. You know, even, you know, now like it's, uh, you know, it's not a bad idea to, even if your pool's not busy, just backwash once a week, right? Get that media off, get new media on and you're, you're hanging on to a lot of stuff. And that I, the longer you hold on to that, the more you know, localized chlorine demand you have. And that's just, just a contributing factor to the overall result. Well, I love that you said that because I do think, you know, certainly we teach operators to to monitor the pressure gauge on a filter or the influent and the effluent gauge. That is a consideration for when to backwash and to always know your system and not just to schedule it on a certain day. But I do think that people also miss the point, which is look at your water quality. If your water quality is not good, it doesn't really matter what the gauge is at or where it's been. I mean, maybe the gauge isn't working. Maybe there's something else going on. If the water is getting gross, then it it's something you should look at. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little, as time goes on, I get more in tune with what I look at. I used to, you know, put all the emphasis on looking at the log book. Now mm-hmm. I, there's a little more, more of a gut check when I'm walking around a pool. Like I'm, I'm paying attention to the smell in different places. Um, you know, I, I'll put a little mirror down the side of the pool and look at the clarity across the full distance of the pool, not just top down mm-hmm. from the deck. That's it's hard to really get that perception of clarity just standing on the deck, especially mm-hmm. if it's a shallow part of a pool, right? So to look across, it's like if you're going for a lane swim, you jump in, you got your goggles on, you look across the pool. That's how you know if it's clear or not. Can you see the mm-hmm. tiles on the opposite side? Mm-hmm. That's clear water or not. And it's, you know, if you're just looking from the deck down and checking off that, yeah, I can see the the drain covers. It's, you know, it's probably not sensitive enough to really tell you if there's some operational issues coming on those sensitive values right like have some kind of a benchmark in this corner of the pool i can count the ladder steps on the -hmm. far wall right or you know if you got the budget put put turbidity monitors on right you've got that constant measurement of this is how clear my water is and you can see problems before they become problems too that way um like a sensitive measurement like an ntu value you can see that creeping up before people are standing on the deck questioning what's going on at the pool. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think your point about the water clarity, we often get the way they say we get nose blind to smell, we get visually blind to cues of change. When we're in the pool Monday through Friday, let's say we come into work every day, we may not notice something that is immediately apparent to us when we come in on a Monday or after an absence, we have a fresh perspective. And I'm a huge fan similar to what you've been saying about getting in the pool and just looking in the water quality. A lot of building operators, though, they're not so keen to put on a bathing suit. It's not part of their routine. But even grabbing a glass of water, putting it in a clear glass jar or bottle and taking it to another location. So I used to do this in the staff room kitchen, pool water in a glass with some tap water in another glass next to it. And almost immediately you can see the water you thought was clear starts to look dull and flat and it's certainly it's not a qualitative test by any stretch but it's it's starting to get you to understand that water is clear but that doesn't mean it's clean uh 
We're going to start to wrap up. We've been on here a really long time. Marjan has a question about filter, some other resources to read about filters. I'm going to give that to Brent as homework because I'm sure he has additional resources that he'd like to throw on the show notes. We'll get the German DIN standard. I'll throw on the healthy swimming graphics. We'll throw on some additional resources uh, across the, the, the Googles, the internets, different journal articles that Brent wants to share. So that's going to be it for today. I want to send a big thank you to Brent Miller, Automated Aquatics up in Edmonton, Alberta for a really detailed session. Thank you so much to everyone who's been here today. I'm not going to do any uh, post show. You can catch any of the sessions next week. All of the links are on our website and you can look for this recording up in a few weeks. It's going to take us a little bit of time to get the video edited. So stay safe, everyone, and have a great weekend. All right. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Take care. Bye-bye.